Welcome to the History of European Theatre podcast, and thanks for joining me on this journey through millennia of theatrical history. Episode 94, Gorbiduck, the tragedy of Ferex and Porrex. Last time, a look at the earliest Tudor plays brought us some morally driven history with King John, but also some comedy with the rustic Ralph Royster Doyster and Gamma Gerton's Needle. But now, we can turn to perhaps the greatest theatrical form of the Elizabethan period, tragedy with an early example of the form. This is not the fully formed, deeply insightful and personalised work of later playwrights, but is, nevertheless, worthy of our attention, not just as a bridge between Seneca and the English Elizabethan tragedy, but in its own right. In 1561, Thomas Norton and Thomas Sackville co-wrote the first English drama that is known to have used blank verse. They chose a historic British tale for their subject, but layered into it contemporary political concerns. Gorbiduck was first presented at the Inns of Court during the Christmas celebrations in 1561, and then at the Palace at Whitehall for the Queen on the 18th of January. The script was first published in September 1665, and then reprinted with corrections by the authors in 1570. A third edition was published in 1590. The co-authorship is striking. A publisher's note in the second edition states that Thomas Norton wrote the first three acts and Thomas Sackville wrote acts four and five. Textual study of the script corroborates that statement. Although collaboration was common at the time, such a firm division of labour is unusual, in fact, I think, unique, and there is no obvious explanation for it. It has been suggested that it might have been a case of Norton running out of steam on the project, or facing time constraints due to other commitments, so that he asked the like-minded Sackville to complete it. Or perhaps Sackville volunteered to do so, impressed by his friend's work. Or perhaps it was some sort of agreed pact from the start. Some also see Norton's hand in some of the later parts of the play, which was revised and corrected in later editions apparently by both authors. The debate will no doubt continue, and more on that later, but first, who were these two authors? Thomas Norton was born in 1532 in London, attended Cambridge University and became secretary to the first Duke of Somerset. It's a very standard route for intellectual literary men of the period. In 1555, he became a student at the Inner Temple. This was one of the inns of court that were effectively the trade guild for barristers and judges. You've already heard mention of them as a breeding ground for radical thought and discussion, and a place where Latin plays were studied and sometimes performed. He married well, twice. First to Marjorie Cramner, daughter of the Archbishop Thomas Cramner, and then, on her death a few years later, to Alice Cramner, Marjorie's cousin and daughter of Archdeacon Edmund Cramner. Norton was politically active and became a Member of Parliament in 1562. Later in his career, he took on senior roles in the government of the City of London and travelled to continental Europe on legal business for the Crown. He was always a staunch supporter of the Cramner's family religious views and, as he grew older, he became more extreme. He was the official censor of Catholics from 1581, and his enthusiastic imprisonment and torture of that group earned him the nickname Rackmaster General. But even he managed to then fall foul of the complexities of Elizabethan politics, and was himself imprisoned in the Tower of London for a short time. After his release, his health never recovered, and he died in March 1584. As well as Gorbiduck, his literary works included many poems and particularly sonnets, and then pamphlets espousing Puritan and Calvinist views. His co-author, Thomas Sackville, was born in 1536, and as the grandson on his mother's side of a Lord Mayor of London and a distant relation of Anne Boleyn's, mother of the woman who, as things worked out, was to become Queen, he was likely always destined for high office, and his trajectory was similar to that of Norton. He also attended Cambridge University, but then transferred to Oxford, where he achieved an MA degree. He was accepted to the Inner Temple, and was then called to the bar, before being elected to Parliament in 1558. He also travelled in Europe, and there are sketchy records of him being detained in Rome for a couple of weeks. 
It was at a time of considerable tension between England and the papacy, so it's assumed his incarceration was related to this and he was probably being used as a bargaining chip in some greater game. He was made a baron and then sent to France on the Queen's business in 1571. His task was to congratulate King Charles IX on his recent marriage to Elizabeth of Austria, but also, and far more importantly and delicately, to discuss the possibility of Elizabeth marrying his younger brother, the Duke of Anjou. It was a proposal that, of course, came to nothing, but Sackville's star continued to rise as he completed several more diplomatic missions over the next few years, not least when he was sent to deliver confirmation of the death sentence that had been passed on Mary in 1586. A year later, he was appointed ambassador to the Netherlands. When the authorities there made a complaint against the Earl of Leicester, Sackville was judged to have handled the matter badly. He was replaced and confined to his home for the best part of a year. It's thought that this disgrace, which was relatively short-lived, had more to do with Leicester's popularity at court, where he was the current favourite of the Queen, than with Sackville's diplomatic performance, and after his release he was inducted into the Order of the Garter, which is the most senior order of knighthood in England, and was back in the Netherlands the following year. In 1599, he was appointed Lord Treasurer, where he was regarded as a safe pair of hands as a financial manager. He was kept in position, surviving the transition of power on the accession of James I, until his death in April 1608. He died very wealthy, having acquired several estates throughout England and highly regarded for his public service. So much so that when he was ailing and feared to be close to death, the king sent one of his closest companions to wish him well and brought him a ring from the king's hand as a mark of respect. He recovered from that particular illness but died at a Privy Council meeting in April 1608, apparently having suffered a stroke or, as it was known at the time, dropsy on the brain. Sackville's other literary works are confined to poetry, his allegorical poem Induction being particularly well regarded. The attendance of the Queen at that performance of Gorbiduck in Whitehall Palace may have been down to Sackville's relationship to her. She was always keen to promote and help her mother's relations and was no doubt aware of Sackville's reputation as an up-and-coming star, even as a young man. This seems a much more likely explanation than she wanted to check out if her cousin and his friends were overstepping in any way. We don't know what she thought of the play, but we can assume that she wasn't offended by its message as no one concerned with the production ended up in prison as far as records show. Nevertheless, this is clearly a politically motivated play, which really is no surprise given that it was written by two men with legal training who would both become parliamentarians and moved in royal and courtly circles. The play opens with a dumb show, the first of several performed during the play to prefigure the action. The opening dumb show is described in the script as follows. First, the music of violins begins to play during which comes upon the stage six wild men clothed in leaves, of whom the first bear in his neck a faggot of small sticks, which they all then both severally and together assayed with all their strengths to break, but it could not be broken by them. At the length one of them plucked out one of the sticks and break it, and the rest, plucking out all the other sticks one after the other, did exactly break them, and same being severed which being conjoined they had before attempted in vain. After they had this done, they departed the stage and the music ceased. Hereby what signified that any state knit in unity doth continue strong against all force, but being divided is easily destroyed. As befell upon Duke Gorbiduck, dividing his land to his two sons, which he held in monarchy, and up on the dissension of the brethren to whom it was divided. The action is further foreshadowed when the play proper opens, with Queen Vidina telling her eldest son Ferex that her husband the king has unnaturally decided to divide his kingdom equally between his two sons, thereby denying Ferex his true birthright to the whole kingdom. Ferex is a little disbelieving of this and seemingly less concerned than his mother, but he resolves to seek out the king to discover the details for himself. 
In the next scene, Gobiduck declares to his council that he does indeed plan to divide his lands between his sons. In a series of long speeches, his councillors advise him that this is a bad idea. As evidence, they cite the story of the cousins, Senyadag and Morgan, who once ruled Britain together. When the two began to argue about the rightful ownership of the throne, they lost faith in each other and Senyudag killed Morgan. Gorboduck thanks his council for the warning, but nevertheless proceeds with the idea. Herman is advisor to Ferex and quite a schemer. He tells him that he should take Porex's share of the kingdom at the first chance he gets. Tinder, Porex's advisor, tells Porex that Ferex intends to start a war against him. To preempt this, Porex invades Ferex's part of the kingdom, which in Ferex's view confirms the suspicions that had been planted in him. Dorden, a councillor assigned by the old king to his eldest son, sends word to Gorbiduck that the brothers are fighting. The king laments the fact that history has repeated itself, but declines to mobilise his men to intervene. Then the messenger Nuntius enters, bringing the news that Ferex has been slain. Porex seeks an audience with Gorbiduck and explains that he had no choice but to kill his brother, given that Ferex wanted to take his land. Gorbiduck makes no final judgment about the feud between his sons. Vadina laments the death of her eldest and favourite son and thinks on how she can revenge him. We hear a report of how that night she went to Porex's bedside and stabs him to death. Outraged by the double murder in the royal family, the people blame Gorbiduck for the death of Porex, who was much loved, and rise up to kill him and Vidina. The nobles gather their retained men to fight the rebels, as the question of the line of succession becomes a pressing matter for debate. Fergus, the Duke of Albany, plots to seize the throne. He amasses an army with the help of his friends, just as the allied nobles defeat the rebels. They resolve that Fergus too must be defeated, declaring him a foreign enemy. A noble, Arostus, tries to mediate the dispute through the controls of good government, proposing that Parliament should decide the identity of the next king. In the play's final scene, the councillor Eubulius laments the tragedy that has befallen the kingdom. He states that it could have been prevented had the kingdom simply relied on Parliament from the beginning. He describes a vision of the future in which justice triumphs over greed. But now, O happy men, whom speedy death deprives of life, ne'er is in force to see these huggy mischiefs and these miseries, these civil wars, these murders and these wrongs. Of justice, yet must Jove in fine restore this noble crown unto the lawful heir, for right will always live and rise at length. But wrong can never take deep root to last. The story of the old legend of Gorboduc was taken from The History of Kings of Britain, written by Geoffrey of Monmouth in the 1130s. This was not a history as we would understand it, but a blend of historical fact, fiction, myth and legend. It was a seminal work in establishing the Arthurian myth in British culture and for promoting the King Lear story, with all its similarities to Gorboduc. Geoffrey's account is short and rather dry, but Norton and Sackville amended and embellished it, showing perhaps that they at least had an eye for the dramatic possibilities of the story. Geoffrey of Monmouth's version says that the old king was senile when he decided to split the kingdom, but in the play there's no sign of this. Indeed, in the early scenes, the king is vigorous and attentive to his counsel, even if he cannot see the value of their advice. Norton and Sackville put responsibility for Gorboduc's actions firmly on his own hands. For better or worse, these are problems of the king's own making, because he chooses to ignore the natural order of succession and impose on it his personal view. As I said up front, this is a political play. Norton and Sackville saw connections between these old stories from a mythic Britannic past, Seneca's family and blood feud driven tragedies, and their own current anxieties regarding Queen Elizabeth I's right to rule and to determine the rightful succession to her throne. The play borrows some plot elements from Seneca's tragic plays, but it is also considered to have distinctly departed from such earlier models. 
There is little doubt that it prefigures Shakespeare's King Lear and, to some extent, Titus Andronicus. But unlike the original legend, the play concludes with optimism, which is, I think, quite significant. Sackville and Norton's Gorbiduck subverts the tragic story that it's based on, showing that civilization can survive the failures of its individual members, no matter how powerful they are. You will remember Sir Philip Sidney and his Apology for Poetry. He specifically mentions Gorbiduck in that work, citing it as being faulty. It is, in his view, a failed attempt to imitate the precedents of the classical drama of Seneca. He says, It is faulty in both place and time, the two necessary companions of all corporal actions. For where the stage should always represent but one place, and the utmost time presupposed in it should be, both by Aristotle's precept and common reason, but one day. There is both many days and many places inartificially imagined. As I've mentioned before, Sidney was harsh where theatre was concerned, but there is some truth in his assessment if one is wedded to Aristotle. But he did admit that the play was full of stately speeches and well-sounding phrases. As followers of Seneca, and some commentators maintain that at the Inns of Court, he was revered in a cult-like status. We would expect the playwrights to stick to Aristotle and the classical form, and make Sir Philip a happier man than he was. But Norton and Sackville were adherents only to a point. This is a five-act play. It has a chorus to comment on the action, and violent action is handled off stage and reported. So there's several Aristotelian boxes ticked but they do break with the unities of time and place. This can be seen as the playwrights being influenced by other traditions. You will remember that the medieval plays allowed for so much passage of time that they were, in a sense, outside of time, and multiple locations that in reality were vast distances apart were shown on the same stage, often at the same time. And in that sense, the play has one foot in the classical and one in the medieval. Views on this play really do cover quite a range. Some critics see it as more melodrama than tragedy, and from others I have also seen it called nothing more than a Senecan pastiche. Yet, for most, it holds its place significantly as the first English blank verse tragedy, and the most ardent supporters of the play see much more in it than that. Although the story concerns the fate of a kingdom through the faulty actions of a king, and was clearly intended to resonate through current concerns, it is also a story of familial mistrust, of overbearing love and of violence towards the nearest and dearest. Almost every significant action in the play concerns the actions of the husband, the wife and the siblings, and in this way it is very indebted to Seneca. None of the violence done to others is shown on stage, but reported by a messenger in the Greek tradition. The initial exposition of the play thesis through the dumb show is a device borrowed from the medieval traditions. Although, as I've mentioned, it's unashamedly Senecan, it is a play that incorporated elements from the English stage and picks out themes of current concern to the English, hence its reputation as the first English tragedy. The implied context is the War of the Roses, which gave the authors the opportunity to discuss, we could say preach, the desirability of legitimacy and good order when it comes to royal succession. It's difficult to imagine that this was not obvious to all who saw the play, given the not long past dynastic struggle between the Yorkists and the Lancastrians, and even more recent concerns and uncertainties around the succession of Henry VIII and his children, not to mention the current speculations about Elizabeth's own path to furthering the dynasty. Norton and Sackville already had models for this type of political historical theatre. Bale's King John is an example that I discussed in the last episode, but Nicholas Udall's Res Publica from about 1553 and the even earlier Magnificence by John Skelton all use medieval history as a way of highlighting their concerns for the welfare of the realm and the government's stability. These concerns were not prominent in Seneca, who as an advisor to Nero could not afford even veiled criticism of his unstable emperor, and neither is the religious morality that pervades all of the Tudor plays. 
Wherein King John, the allegorical nature of the characters through personification is obvious, in Gorbiduck, Norton and Sackville take a step or two away from obvious personification by giving some of their characters slightly disguised Greek-originated names that would have been meaningful to the educated who were, after all, the audience they were writing for. The councillors are named Arostus, meaning weak, Philander, meaning seeking to please, and Abulius, meaning sound judgment. We might also see medieval allegorical characterization of tempting devils in the two parasitic characters, Herman and Tinder, who follow Ferex and Porex respectively, whispering in their ears and sowing discord. But there are good reasons why this play is little known, rarely performed and, to put it bluntly, no King Lear. The speeches in the play are long, verbose and static. In that sense, very Senecan, but not in a good way for the drama. We get a sense of this in the second act, where Gorbiduck receives long and wise advice from his several councillors, which he then bats away with a word, his view of the division of the kingdom completely unchanged. And then you would expect that the play would build to the climax of the death of the Queen and the King, but we only hear a report of their ultimate demise in the opening of the short fifth act. For the drama, this is a weak ending. But to understand the reasoning behind it, we have to look at the context. When trying to understand current events, the intellectuals of the period would have first looked to the Bible and God, but they held the events of history in only slightly less esteem. This is why the history play was to become such an important part of the theatrical canon. This play was, for its authors, most centrally about issues of royal inheritance and national welfare. It was propaganda for stable and ordered dynastic succession. The two scenes in the last act taken up with speeches about the fall of the king and the kingdom were, in their view, entirely justified, even if we think they detract from the dramatic climax. This was the lesson that Norton and Sackville wanted to preach. They are repeating of the message of the play to drive it home at the end. Norton had first highlighted it much earlier on in the play, where the message is... And this great king, that doth divide his land, and change the course of his descending crown, and yields the rein into his children's hand, from blissful state of joy and great renown, a mirror shall become to princes all, to learn to shun the cause of such a fall. It is not a direct comparison with Elizabeth's position, but nevertheless the message was, Get married and provide an heir of undisputed legitimacy, or your kingdom is in peril. Debate is central, and the play has much of the structure of a debate, and no doubt reflects the way of the thinking that the two authors were being trained in. The debate over morals or morality by churchmen often took the form of an argument and counter-argument put to a vacillating central figure. A very similar debating style was part of the legal training at the inns of court. The problem is that this means the play ends up feeling rather forensic and professional in its language, which is out of harmony with the idea of a family dysfunction being at the centre of the play. Gorbiduck comes to us through the original publication in 1565, printed by William Griffiths, whose shop was in a small courtyard at the sign of the Falcon off Fleet Street in London. Just one copy of this version exists. When a second version was published in 1570, it was suggested in the publisher's note that the original version was unauthorised and contained many errors and omissions, because at the time Sackville was out of the country and Norton away from London. He concluded, I mean, though they were very much displeaseth, she so ran abroad without leave, whereby she caught her shame, as many wantons do. Yet seeing the case as it is remediless, have for common honesty and shamefastness now apparelled, trimmed and attired her in such a frame as she was before. In which better form, since she hath come to me, I have harboured her for her friend's sake and her own. And I do not doubt that her parents, the authors, will not now be discontent, that she go abroad amongst you good readers, so it be in honest company. I think that's a charming extended metaphor about the play, but it's probably something of an exaggeration, and nothing much more than a marketing ploy, as the early edition was not so error-ridden as is made out, and was still the major basis for this new edition, 
and modern editions use readings from both editions where the quality of the original verse is thought to be superior to the later corrections. Seven copies of the later printing are known to exist today. This is a little episode that also serves to illustrate how little control playwrights had over the printing of their work. In many cases, plays were bought by acting troops or theatre managers, and it was at that point that the author's financial interest ended. There was no copyright law at the time, and so no redress for pirated printings or performances or alarmingly similar plays suddenly appearing. To make a good living, a playwright had to produce new work on a regular basis which is just one of the reasons for not only the great number of plays produced in the period, but the tendency for playwrights to rework existing plays into new versions. Gorbaduck may have seemed quite innovative for its time. As I mentioned, it was written in blank verse. Now we are all very familiar with blank verse and iambic pentameter, even if our only exposure to the literature of the period is Shakespeare. The form was invented, or perhaps we should say first meaningfully used, by Henry Howard, Earl of Surrey, in 1547, so cannot have been widely known by the time Norton and Sackville decided to use it for their play. But most scholars agree that the form is used confidently and mostly to good effect. Any criticism of the form tends to highlight its predictability in some places. It seems that Sackville and Norton had spotted that blank verse was a good form to allow characters of stately import and bearing to express their extended ideas. But what is certainly missing is the range of vocabulary that was to appear in surer hands 20 and 30 years later. There is no sense here of the agile mind of a Shakespeare or a Johnson at work. The elements that I've already mentioned, the medieval influence, the formalist debate structure and the lack of confidence with the poetic form are all holding it back to one degree or another. The language is repetitive and it lacks the use of simile and metaphor that was to become so common. All of these elements leave us with the feeling that the play is stilted and rather cold. I've seen it called antiseptic and I think that sums it up rather well. But to look to the positive... The opening scene between Ferex and Vadina is a good opening, albeit too brief. It could be read with a subtext of incestuous love and played with an intensity that we would usually find in the works of later playwrights. Unfortunately, the next scene between the king and his counsellors doesn't fulfil that promise, as I've mentioned, so it is Act 2 that is the most dramatically satisfying part of the play. As Ferex and Porrex are tempted by their advisers, there are some nice elements of characterisation and dramatic tension. There's a good mirroring of the reaction of the brothers to their parasites' proposals, and the implicit debate about the value of preemptive aggression versus a good and well-prepared defence is well balanced. Act 3 reverts to static debate until news arrives of the death of Forex. But then Gorbaduck's muted response to the news means an opportunity for emotional pathos is missed. Vaidina again proves to be one of the best parts in the play when, in Act 4, she delivers some truly Senecan speeches as she uses some verbose language and strong imagery while she considers how to revenge her son. In her anguish, she says, O oh, my beloved son, O oh, my sweet child, my dear Ferex, my joy, my life's delight. Is my beloved son, sweet child, my dear Ferex, my joy, my life's delight, murdered with cruel death? O oh, hateful wretch, O oh, heinous traitor, both to heaven and earth! Thou, Porrex, thou this damned deed hath wrought. Thou, Porrex, thou shalt dearly by the same. Traitor to kin and kind, to sire and me, to thine own flesh, and traitor to thyself. The gods on thee in hell shall wreak their wrath, and here on earth this hand shall take revenge on thee, Porrex, thou false and caitiff white. And that's only a few lines of her eighty-line soliloquy. She is still a rather grotesque character, but her mother's grief and anger at the loss of her favourite son does at least have a hint of psychological truth about it. It is a shame that in the next scene Gorbaduck does not show something similar in his reaction to Porrex's explanation of his actions. Once again, we are bogged down in cold speeches and impersonal rhetoric. The passionate account of Vidina's death given by Marcella, her lady-in-waiting, 
ends the act, and has to function as the dramatic conclusion to the play, given that the last short fifth act is taken up with debate between the councillors and the would-be king Fergus, characters in which we have little interest and who are there at this point just to emphasise the lesson delivered by the play. Gorbiduck is a play that has been noted by some for the level of violence it contains, yet by others as a rather dull but interesting forerunner to the tragedies to come. And in an odd way, it is both of these things. The influence of Seneca is undeniable, and as a play of historic interest, it illustrates very well how pervasive the influence of Seneca was in the Tudor period, and therefore on the development of English drama as a whole. But the then concerns of English aristocratic society are also very clear. Late in the day, in the 1990s to be precise, an early comment on the play was discovered. This was written by an anonymous audience member to the production at the Inns of Court. It is interesting that the thoughts on the play that he chose to record were that many things were handled of marriage, and it meant that it was better for the Queen to marry Lord Robert known than with Sweden. So, this commentator focused on the political concerns of the time and saw that the playwrights supported the idea of the Queen marrying Lord Robert Dudley rather than the then current proposal of the King of Sweden, another of Elizabeth's potential suits that came to nothing. Norton and Sackville maintained in their play that only through an Englishman and the consent of Parliament can successful succession be assured. They say, within sight of the end of the play, Such one, my lords, let be your chosen king, such one so born within your native lands. This is the way to break the historic cycle of violence and division and move to a prosperous future. Next time, I'm going to talk about a selection of what we now think of as minor Elizabethan playwrights. Some of the names you will no doubt have heard of, others probably not. They may have fallen into the very big and deep shadows of certain other playwrights now, but in their time some were more famous than the names we remember, and certainly had something to say. And if anyone can come up with a good collective noun for a group of playwrights, then please let me know. In the meantime, please join the Facebook page or group, or find us on Instagram or Twitter to keep up to date with the podcast and other theatre things. If you'd like to help support the podcast, the easiest thing would be to pass on the word to anyone you think might be interested in a bit of theatre history. Or, if you have a moment, write a review and rate the podcast in your podcast app of choice. You can find details of other ways to support on the podcast website at www.thehistoryofeuropeantheatre.com. And as you know from the previous bonus episode, there is also additional content on Patreon that you can access for a small monthly fee. I look forward to your company next time, but if you have any comments or concerns in the meantime, you can contact me by email at thoetp at gmail.com or via Twitter at thoetp. (laughs) 